It's the start of your shift, and you're in the middle of your rig check when the tones go off. You're dispatched to a nearby construction site for an injury. When you arrive, you see what looks like a detached garage with the roof caved in. The foreman tells you that they were replacing the roof tiles when it collapsed. One of his men is pinned beneath the rubble, and it looks like it's going to take a while to get him out. You're listening to 911 Cast, the no nonsense EMS podcast. This episode is brought to you by Madison Programs, a Brooklyn based medical training and consulting company with over 20 years of experience specializing in emergency medical and continuing education and AHA certification classes like CPR and first aid for community members and professionals. For more information, email madisonprograms at aol.com. I'm Scott Topiel, and this week, it's all about crush injuries. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the words crush injury? Do you picture a person trapped in a collapsed building after an earthquake, or a driver trapped in a car that careened off the side of a mountain? Or perhaps you imagine a construction worker, their leg pinned underneath fallen steel and concrete. Regardless of the cause, crush injuries can lead to crush syndrome, a life-threatening condition that requires early recognition and aggressive treatment. When large muscles, like the ones in the lower extremities, are compressed or crushed for at least one hour, muscle cells start to die and leak. The weight of the compression acts like a tourniquet, keeping the dangerous contents of the damaged muscle tissue near the site of the injury. But when the victim is extricated and that crushing weight is removed, blood flow suddenly returns and those built-up toxins that include things like potassium, phosphorus, and myoglobin, a protein found in muscles that can damage kidneys, enter the circulation. Crush syndrome can lead to what's been nicknamed the smiling death, so called because the victim is initially happy to be rescued. But the victim isn't the only one that's happy, so are all those toxins that have been trapped along with them. Once these toxins start moving, organ failure and death, most often from ventricular fibrillation caused by the high levels of potassium, occur within minutes. Whether your patient has been pinned beneath an overturned car or trapped under the rubble of a collapsed building, the most important thing you can do for them after ensuring that their ABCs are intact is to provide early and continuous IV fluids, usually normal saline. While always following your local protocols, the most common approach is to administer one liter of fluid per hour for up to two hours, starting as soon as possible during the extrication. If extrication takes longer than two hours, then the infusion is slowed down to 500 milliliters per hour. In cases where you know that the patient has pre-existing heart or renal failure, then the fluid can be titrated to 10 milliliters per kilogram per hour. The importance of getting these fluids on board early and before the compressive force is removed cannot be emphasized enough. Without this IV infusion, the dangerous toxins we talked about earlier are allowed to concentrate and become more potent. By ensuring that the patient is well hydrated, you dilute the potassium making it less dangerous to the heart. The extra fluid also helps the kidneys filter blood more effectively, reducing the risk of serious kidney damage or failure. Of course, these types of traumas are often complicated, and establishing two large bore IVs might not be possible. In these cases, you may want to consider establishing intraosseous access. And if you have the choice between a humeral head IO and one in the leg, go for the humeral site since it'll provide you with an infusion rate about 6 liters per hour, compared to 1 liter per hour at the proximal tibia. In addition to IV fluid administration, you'll also want to start continuous cardiac monitoring and obtain periodic 12 lead EKGs during the extrication if possible. Be on the lookout for telltale signs of hyperkalemia, rising potassium levels. One early sign is an increasing PR interval. Remember, The normal PR interval is 120 to 200 milliseconds. If you notice that this interval is increasing, start thinking about hyperkalemia. Other EKG changes that can suggest hyperkalemia include PVCs, bradycardia, peaked T waves, and a widening QRS interval. If you suspect hyperkalemia, follow your related treatment protocols. In general, Calcium gluconate or calcium chloride, depending on which one you carry, 
is administered first to help stabilize the heart muscle and make it less sensitive to the rising potassium level. After calcium is administered, nebulized albuterol can be given to help temporarily shift potassium out of circulation and into the cells. Although its use is controversial and not largely supported by the current literature, some protocols call for sodium bicarbonate. If you do administer bicarb, be sure that you flush really well first so that you don't cause it to precipitate with any calcium that you've given. In Los Angeles County, the current protocol is to administer 1 gram of calcium chloride, followed by 50 milliequivalents of sodium bicarb, and 10 milligrams of nebulized albuterol 5 minutes prior to extrication to help prevent potassium-induced cardiac arrest. This is in addition to the IV fluid resuscitation we discussed a moment ago. If you happen to work in a system that carries insulin, your protocol will likely include a combination of insulin and dextrose. This is because insulin temporarily moves potassium back into cells, especially when used in combination with albuterol. And the purpose of the dextrose? Well, that's just to prevent your patient from becoming hypoglycemic from the insulin. If you absolutely can't establish IV or IO access for fluids and an extremity has been crushed, try to place two tourniquets, one right next to the other, on the trapped limb just before extrication and make them tight. This will prevent the accumulated toxins from being circulated once the compression has been relieved. After the victim has been freed, start your line and get your fluids and other appropriate medications on board. Don't remove or loosen the tourniquets unless advised to do so by your medical control. While we're on the subject of tourniquets, if you think that a trapped extremity might start to hemorrhage, you should pre-position a tourniquet without tightening it so that it's ready for use if severe bleeding occurs. All of these treatments are really intended for patients that have had circumferential compression of a large muscle group. That might be a person's leg or pelvis, or it might be their shoulder or torso. But crush injuries can occur to a lesser degree in any situation where a person faces prolonged immobility with part of their body weight against a firm surface. For instance, a person could fall at home and fracture their hip, which might cause them to be unable to stand or move. As a result, they remain lying on the ground, their body pressed against the floor, until someone eventually finds them hours later. This situation often leads to the same buildup of toxins that crush injury causes, though usually to a lesser degree. We call this rhabdomyolysis. These patients are potentially unstable and should be monitored closely for signs of hyperkalemia and the development of shock. IV crystalloids are usually indicated as well, though not as aggressively as those at risk for true compression syndrome. Your team, together with the construction crew, start working to free the trapped roofer. Both of his legs and one of his arms are trapped beneath the rubble, but his torso is free and he's able to talk. The structure is really unstable, so the extrication proceeds slowly and deliberately. Realizing that by the time your team is able to free him, he'll have been trapped for well over an hour, you establish an IV in his free arm and begin administering a liter bolus of IV saline. You also place him on your cardiac monitor carefully watching for EKG changes that might suggest the development of hyperkalemia. As weight begins to lift off his legs, you notice he's developed some occasional PVCs. You know that extra potassium is being released and administer calcium chloride and nebulized albuterol per medical direction to counter the developing hyperkalemia. The victim is eventually freed and transported to the trauma center without incident. He's treated for multiple injuries and released from the hospital a week later. When large muscles are subjected to compression for as little as one hour, muscle cells become damaged and release toxic contents, including potentially lethal amounts of potassium into the surrounding tissues and blood. When the victim is freed and the crushing force is released, blood flow is restored to the area and these dangerous substances begin to circulate throughout the body, leading to ventricular fibrillation and death. By recognizing patients that are at risk for crush syndrome, administering IV fluids early and continuously during extrication, and monitoring closely for changes in patient condition, you can improve your patient's chances of surviving crush trauma. That's it for this episode of 911 Cast. We'd like to thank our founding sponsor, OneKit, makers of high quality first aid kits. Check out their products at buyonekit.com 
That's B-U-Y-O-N-E kit.com. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and review us on Apple Podcasts. Until next time, thanks for listening.